Um, and so let's, let's begin with Acts of the Apostles. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. This is our very first chapter as we get started today. Okay? And if we go to Acts chapter 9, if you guys remember what happened in, in ch Acts chapter 7 and chapter 8, we, we had the martyrdom of St. Stephen. And so in Acts chapter 9, it says, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest to ask for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am. Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And I will show him much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So those are the key words right there that I want you to notice right there is verse 15 and 16. If you look at verse 15 and 16, look at that closely. How does the Lord talk about Saul, whose, whose Hebrew name is Saul and his Roman name is Paul? How does he talk about him? Look at that right there. How does he describe Saul? He's what? He's a chosen instrument. He's going to bring my name before who? The Gentiles. And then what's the third thing? He's going to suffer. He's going to suffer for my name. So three things. Chosen instrument, bring my name before the Gentiles, and he's going to suffer for my name. And, that, and, the, and the reason I start with, the, with that description, well, number one, it's God's description of Saul. You can't get better than that, right? But if you really look at how the Lord is describing Saul, Hebrew name, Paul, Roman name, you, you go, wow, this is, this is like summing up everything that's going to happen in, Paul, in Paul's life, in Saul's life right here. He's a, he's a chosen instrument. And I, I like to start with that because you have a lot of modern scholars who, who don't like Paul. You have a lot of modern people who don't like Paul. Walk into your, your you know, bookstores and, and you see all these books. Paul was a bigot and he hated women and he hated, you know, he hated all these people and, you know, don't listen to him. You know, and, and, and it's like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second here. Let's see how God talks about him. God says he's my chosen instrument. He's going to bring my name before Gentiles. And he's also going to suffer for my name. And, and so for, for that very reason, the topics that Paul or Saul has to bring up the topics that he has to bring up are sometimes just a little bit different than the Gospels because he's bringing the name of the Lord before Gentiles. So people often say, see, Paul talks about this, but you don't find it in the Gospel. Well, let's talk about why. Jesus is bringing the Gospel to his people, and now Saul is going out to the Gentiles to bring his Gospel to them. And so that you can understand why these topics have to be addressed because these are problems with the Gentiles. So I bring that all up because when you look just at those two verses, you go, boom, there it is. Now let's talk a little bit about Acts of the Apostles. I don't know how if this chord stretches right here, but let's, let's talk a little bit about Acts of the Apostles. I want to see if you guys um, know Acts of the Apostles very well. Have you read Acts of the Apostles? Of course you have. And if you go to Daily Mass right now, you'll get a lot of Acts of the Apostles. So in Acts chapter 1, we've got a quick, quick summary of Acts of the Apostles. So Acts chapter 1, okay, what do we have in Acts chapter 1? 
We have uh, the, the ascension to heaven. Jesus' ascension. And then, and then in, in Acts chapter 2, you have the day of, you have Pentecost. How many days after the Passover is Pentecost? 50 days after the Passover? Okay. And uh, where do they receive the Holy Spirit? Upper room. Okay. Very good. 50 days, they receive the Holy Spirit in the upper room. What happened in the upper room? What are the four events? Last Supper, first resurrection appearance on the day of the resurrection. Second resurrection appearance uh, with Thomas. That's this Sunday's gospel. And then finally, Pentecost. Okay. And so Acts chapter 2, you have Pentecost. What is the Holy Spirit called? Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem so you can receive the, the paraclete, the counselor. But what is, what is it described as? Nobody got a chance to look at the notes yet, I guess. huh? The, the gift and the promise. Gift and promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father. Isn't that beautiful? The promise of the Father. So this concept of the Holy Spirit as gift and promise. And this is really, really amazing. Gift and promise. You know, promise, promise in the sense of like this is this is what God wanted us to do. He wanted us to walk in the Holy Spirit. In uh, Numbers chapter eleven, Numbers chapter eleven, uh, there's an event that happens where the Lord pours out the Spirit of prophecy on the seventy elders. You remember that with Moses and the seventy elders, and two of them. You know, Adad and Medad are in the camp of the people, and they receive the Spirit and begin to prophesy among the people, and, and some pe people get mad, what's going on? You shouldn't be around the people. And Moses says in Numbers eleven twenty nine these famous words, would that all of God's people be prophets? You're, I don't know if you remember that from Numbers chapter eleven twenty nine. It's It's like Moses saying, would that all of God's people be filled with the Holy Spirit? And so in Job, if you go to the prophecy of Job, Job chapter 2 or in Job chapter 3, it's numbered a little bit differently in different Bibles. Job talks about how the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. In the concept of spirit and flesh, very important because it's like Joel, Joel chapter 2 through 3. Maybe did I say Job? Joel chapter 2 through 3. Joel is, ta is making this contrast. The Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. It's like Joel is saying, look, we need to be transformed by the Spirit. We need to be transformed by the Spirit. And this will help you understand what Paul talks about, because Paul's going to talk about what it means to walk according to the Spirit. Just as Jews walked according to the Torah, now we're going to walk according to the Spirit. We're going to be guided by the Spirit. We're going to walk according to the Spirit. In order to walk according to the Spirit, we have to deny ourselves. And so... So Pentecost, the gift and the promise of the Spirit. And so when the Spirit comes upon the church, then you get the, you get the preaching of Peter uh, in Acts chapters 2 through 4. And I, and I love, I love look, looking at Peter's homilies when you, when you look at how Peter preaches. Just think about this on Pentecost. You have all these pilgrims who are coming to Jerusalem. And Peter d does something really amazing. He says, you know what? You guys all know where David's tomb is. Have any of you guys been to Jerusalem? Any of you guys been to Jerusalem? You've been to Jerusalem? Any of you been to the upper room? Who's been to the upper room before? Okay. How many of you went below the upper room afterwards? You missed, the, you missed all of Acts chapter 2 if you didn't go below. I'm just kidding with you. But <laughs> be, below, the, below the upper room, amazingly, below the upper room is the tomb of David. And it's a synagogue. And most people don't even know this. They go, to, they go to the upper room. This is so beautiful. We're in the upper room. And they forget about going below. Because Peter's basically saying, guess what, guys? He, we know where the tomb of David is. And we know that God said to David in, in Psalm chapter 16, I will not allow my Holy One to experience corruption. And wait a minute. But if, if David's tomb's here in Jerusalem, I mean, you guys are pilgrims. You probably have all visited. And you know where it is. Guess what? the fullest meaning of these words are. They're fulfilled in Christ, who's risen from the dead, whose tomb is empty. And so, uh, so you know, from the, you know, Peter's, Peter's homily, it, it emphasizes that, look it, Christ is like David, but he's different. And, and, Peter, and Peter goes on and he, and he talks about how this one whom God has made Lord, you have crucified. You put to death the author of of life. You remember that? But what, a, what an amazing contradiction. You put to death the offer of life. And then, it's, it, and then as it goes on, it says that they were cut to the heart. Their hearts were pierced. And, and it underlines the conversion of the people. So what's beautiful about Peter's preaching is he's trying to help us to understand 
we're, we are guilty. We're, pers- we're, we're collectively guilty and we're personally guilty. But he's also trying us to understand God is offering this incredible gift of his mercy. Isn't that be- So he's, he's making this contrast between our collective and personal guilt, which all of us have, and then saying, but look at this gift. Look at this gift of God's mercy that he's offering. And, and so what's the key word that he brings up? We have, to, what must we do? What must we do? That's the, huh? Well, you're close, close. Repent. And then what's the second thing? So, be baptized, every one of you. So repent and be baptized. So, so he underlines the importance of repentance, right? Repent and be baptized, each one of you. And, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit, okay? So repent and be baptized, each one of you, and you will receive this gift that God wants to give you so that then you can start to deny yourself. Then you can start to become a disciple of Christ. Then you can live not for yourself, but for our Lord. And, and, so, and so Acts chapters 2 through 4, you see beautiful preaching of St. Peter. I love to read through the homilies of St. Peter every year right after right after Easter and see these amazing things that he brings up. So I bring this up to you because every time you celebrate Easter and you you go and you get to Acts the Apostles and you start to read those homilies of St. Peter, you'll start to go, wow, this is what I should be talking about. This is, this is what I should really be bringing up to people when, it, when I talk to them, okay? So you'll be inspired by that. So what happens to the church, though? What happens as they begin to preach the gospel? What happens to the church? Persecuted, exactly. They begin to be persecuted. And so by the time you get to Acts chapter 4, they're already in trouble. I mean, they're already being put in jail and they're already being persecuted. And so what happens when the whole church in Jerusalem becomes, per- it's being persecuted? What happens? Where do they go and preach the gospel after they're being persecuted in Jerusalem? Well, who do you go to? You go to the Gent- Who do you go to? Which ones especially do you go to? Well, well, who, well, who were the closest ones? Who were the closest ones to the Jews? The Samaritans, right? And it's beautiful. Like you go to the ones who were your enemies. The Gen- they, they, they're, they're Gentiles, but they did believe in the Torah, you know. So they're not quite Jews, but they're Samaritans. They consider themselves. They're kind of a mixed breed. They only accept the first five books. And so the gospel then begins to be preached among the Samaritans, okay? And it's a beautiful image. And so you have, you have the beautiful story of, Saint, uh, of Philip. Do you remember Philip's story? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you remember that story? And the Ethiopian eunuch was on his chariot, and he was reading. And he was reading from, where was he reading from? Isaiah 53, the fourth servant song. And Philip ran up to him. And he said, do you know what you're reading? And do you remember what the Ethiopian eunuch said? How can I unless somebody helps me? And really, this is like the mission of the church. We help people to understand the scriptures so that they can live the faith. This is what our lives are about. We're helping people to understand Christ, to understand the scriptures so that they can live the faith. And so how can I unless somebody helps me, unless somebody explains it? And so Philip talks about how... This scripture passage is fulfilled in Christ. And so, and then the Ethiopian eunuch knows who Jesus is. He wants to be baptized, and he goes back to Ethiopia. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and so right after that story of the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, in Acts chapter 8, of course, you know that Stephen, and he's, Stephen is the very first, one of the very first what? Martyrs? No, you were going to say deacons. One of the very first deacons. <laughs> okay. All right. And so, you know, notice the connection between deacon, martyrdom, deacon, martyrdom, you know. So, <laughs> so I just want you to see that. You know, so, you know, cause, c- because inevitably, you know, you're always going to have problems, conflict, you know, all kinds of issues. And, and you're going you're gonna to be very good little by little. If you live out your own personal spiritual martyrdom, you're going to get better at handling every problem, every conflict. If we don't live that personal martyrdom out, dying to self, Maybe it's harder for us sometimes to handle those issues, right? And so, you know, when you, when you, when you come up pro- across every problem, difficulty, just think, you know, am I really dying to self, living out that spirituality of martyrdom in my life so that way I can be ready for whatever this problem and difficulty is, all right? So you, you have Stephen, 
And if you go to Acts chapter 7, he gives this long speech, right? And he goes kind of through the history of Israel. And he talks about how we've been hard-hearted. And he's stoned to death. And you know where he's stoned to death? The traditional location is right in the, the valley between the Mount of Olives and between the city of Jerusalem. What do you call that valley? you guys remember what that? The Kidron Valley, exactly, right there. And so there's like even like a little tiny chapel to the uh, dedicated to the martyr of St. Stephen right there. And so he's stoned to death. And as he's being stoned to death, what does he say? Lord, do not, do not hold this against them. What does that remind you of? Jesus. Jesus on the cross, right? And so as he's saying that, then suddenly we have a note right at the very beginning of Acts chapter 8 saying, who was approving of the martyrdom of, of Stephen? Saul. Saul. Saul is giving his... He's holding the jackets while it's going on. He's holding the what? He's holding the jackets while it's going on. He's holding the jackets while it's going on. He's, he's approving of it. He's approving of it. And you know, it's, it's really interesting because Jews didn't have the right to administer capital punishment. So this is kind of like a brutal mob event happening here. And here's Saul giving, you know, you know, this is good. This is good that this is happening. Um, and so you have an image of Saul before his conversion approving of the martyrdom of St. Stephen, you know, of this brutal event happening in a valley outside of the city and just a mob killing Stephen, putting him to death. So you can imagine how ugly this scene is. And then Saul going and getting permission so he can go and persecute the church in Damascus. And so here's this man who wants to destroy the church. What was the name for the church, by the way? What was it called? The the way, the way, you see that, that name used. And so he wants to go and destroy the church. And so that takes us to Acts chapter 9, the reading that we had today. And, and you have in Acts chapter 9, you have Saul going, going to Damascus. And he, fall, he's, he falls down and he's blinded. It doesn't say he fell off his horse, but it does say he fell down. He's blinded, okay? And it's, it's uh, you could say providential that he's blinded. It shows you something about about his spiritual condition. He's, he's a man who's blinded by his own ambition, but doesn't have time to really consider what he's doing. So let's take a look here at Acts of the Apostles here. Uh, I want to look at it, just a couple things here. Um, I have a little bit here on Paul's conversion, but if you go right here to this general chronology of the events in Acts of the Apostles, you'll notice that there's a couple times where after Paul's conversion, he goes on, he goes on missionary journeys. And so he goes, he goes on his first missionary journey with who? Barnabas. Barnabas. But then he actually kind of gets into a little dispute with Barnabas. And who does he go on his second missionary journey with? Silas. And then his third missionary journey is the longest journey, okay, and, and, and that's in Acts chapters 18 through 21. Uh, and so what's, I give you a little bit of secular history here as well um, in regards to what was happening with Roman uh, emperors and so forth. But then finally, Paul's fourth missionary journey was kind of as a prisoner. And this is really interesting because it's not really a missionary journey per se, but it is a time where Paul is still evangelizing. Um, and so what's, what's he doing during this time period? There's a, a number of debates over exactly you know, what he was doing uh, during this time period as a prisoner. Uh, when I was in Rome, there was a little place near where we lived, and you could go down about 30 feet and had this area, very, uh, you know, ugly area, but it was the area where Paul was imprisoned. And most people didn't know where it was, so whenever tourists came to Rome who, you know, who I met, I would always take them to this place because it was one of the places, places off the beaten path. Um, but his last, his last journey is to Rome as a prisoner. And what's really interesting is, really after chapter 22 in Acts of the Apostles, the last six chapters are basically Paul's trial and being sent away to Rome uh, as a prisoner. And it doesn't even tell us how he dies. How did Paul die? Do you remember how he died? Beheaded. Beheaded. How did Peter die? Crucified. Crucified upside down. So this is really interesting. Acts just kind of like cuts off in about you know, 65 or A.D., it just cuts off. It doesn't give us the details of Peter and Paul's death, uh, which happened during the persecution of Nero. 
Uh, so, this is that, so this has led to all kinds of questions by scholars, because a lot of scholars say that Acts was probably written in 80 or 90 AD. And then you have some scholars who say, wait a minute, maybe it was written earlier than that. Maybe it was really written in the 60s. And, and uh, you know, that's why it doesn't tell us anything about Peter and St. Paul. And so you have to kind of look at, you know, how the, how the early church talks about the martyrdom of, of those two great saints who were both in Rome, by the way, who were both in Rome. And there's a, there's a number of reasons why they went to Rome. But part of it is, you know, in Rome you have a huge... Jewish community. You have 30,000 Jews who live in Rome. So when you read the, the letter to the Romans, which we're going to get to in a little bit, remember that there's a massive Jewish community there, 30,000, and probably a million citizens who live in and around Rome. So it's one of the biggest cities in the world. It's the capital of the Roman Empire. Uh, and so they're going right to the very center of the Roman Empire to share the gospel. Do you remember Acts chapter 5 when Jesus said to Peter, he said, go out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. Remember that? Go out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. It was like he was saying, go out into the chaos of this world. And let your nets down for a catch. And that's exactly what the apostles did. You know, they, they went to the, you know, to, the, to the places which were, you know, the most diametrically opposed to what the faith was. And there they shared the faith. So, uh, going back to our, our talk on Acts of the Apostles right here, we're, we're, making, we're making a lot of progress right here. So Acts chapter 9, that's when Paul has his conversion. And who's the person who baptizes Paul? What was his name? Ananias. Ananias. What happens after Paul's baptized? His eyes are open. He regains his sight. He regains his sight once he's baptized. Isn't that amazing? So it really tells you something about faith and baptism. You know, like Paul had this encounter with Christ. And through that encounter, he discovered who Jesus is. Uh, each of us has had an encounter with Christ in a certain way. Uh, and, it's, and it's important for us to, to really consider, am I continuing to live out that encounter, the real encounter with Jesus every day of my life? Am I, do I continue to live out that real encounter with Christ in all that I do? Uh, and so the moment he's baptized, his eyes are open. But then what does he also begin to do after he's baptized? He begins to do what? to preach, to share the gospel. So he begins his ministry preaching. So it's almost like immediately after being baptized, he begins to go and tell others about who Jesus is. And of course, he's persecuted. He's running for his life you know, right from the beginning. Uh, and so, so as Paul's preaching the gospel, he's preaching the gospel. The other apostles are preaching the gospel. Peter and James are focusing more on Jews. Paul is focusing more on, on Gentiles. Um, and then you have some problems. And what's, what are some of the problems, uh, you know, questions that you have? You have problems re related to the uh, ritual, you know, cleanliness. Ritual, you could say, cleanliness, circumcision. Something about bacon, foods, <laughs> certain foods that, that one could not eat. So you have, you have a question related to certain practices that are in the law. Are the new converts who are Gentiles, are they obligated to be circumcised? Are they obligated to follow all the ritual aspects of the law? Are they obligated to keep the Sabbath? You know, so you have all these questions about, you know, what do we do with these Gentiles? If Gentiles are now going to receive the faith, are they obligated to become Jews as well? And so what's the answer to that question? How do we solve that difficult question of what is the status of Gentiles? Are they co-heirs? Yes. How, do, how do we sa settle that question? What has to happen? A council, the Council of Jerusalem, right? So the Council of Jerusalem. So in Acts chapter 15, we have the Council of Jerusalem. And so at the Council of Jerusalem, it's really interesting because in the early church, in the early church, uh, James was, was like the bishop of Jerusalem. So let's see if we can find this in, in our notes here. James was kind of like the bishop of Jerusalem, but who received the authority? Who received the, the authority to bind and loose? Who received the keys? Peter, yeah. So when you read the Council of Jerusalem, you have to kind of read it closely. So we'll get to it right here. And I kind of go through it just a little bit here in these notes here so you can find it. 
right around page 64. So if you go to page 64, uh, what's really interesting is some of the believers, some of the believers who brought about the question, they were part of, of who? The Pharisees. So good or bad? You guys. I was going to say, this is good. We have Pharisees who are actually converting to the faith. Isn't that good? Uh, that's, that's good. You have Pharisees who are converting to the faith. Of course, there's, there's still a lot of Pharisee inside of them, and so they're bringing up all these questions, right? But they're, yes. Huh? He was, yes. He describes himself as a Pharisee among Pharisees. That's a, that's a question that has been long debated. Was he, just, uh, was he just saying, I'm a Pharisee among Pharisees? because of how he lived his life, or was he actually part of the Pharisees? Scholars will debate that. But yes, he describes himself as a Pharisee. But what, what I want to just emphasize here is that not all, the Pharise not all of the Pharisees rejected the faith. Many of them accepted the faith. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful to know. But, you know, who would be the most likely one to bring up this question about the Gentiles? Of course, you got it, the Pharisees, right? So that's, that's, it's kind of funny to see, to see that. Um, and, I, and I think it's important to emphasize, you know, that you have... In Acts of the Apostles, you have emphasis on, on the Pharisees. So who's God going to work through before the council? Who is he going to work through before the council to help them settle this question? Peter. Yeah, Paul doesn't take off until after the council. Before the council, the focus is on Peter. He's going to work through Peter. And so he's going to have this vision. And do you remember the vision he has? He has this vision of what? Sheet coming down from heaven, all the bad stuff that you're not supposed to eat is on there. And what's the Lord saying? Hey, time for lunch. Kill and eat. You know. <laughs> and Peter's like, No, Lord, no. And so he has this vision. And what time does the vision occur at? You know what time the vision occurs at? Take a wild guess. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Yeah. And there's 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 actually repetitive emphasis on the importance of the. Th uh, nine o'clock and three o'clock hour how about that right so he has the vision kill and eat no 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 he keeps having it and the lord says do not call on clean what i have called clean now what was the point of the vision it what, was did, you know was god trying to help peter have a good lunch was he trying to say peter i really want you to enjoy this lunch today i want you to have some bacon for for a change okay no what was the point of the vision what was the point the, the, the point is, yeah, to show Peter how, how in the new and eternal covenant, these laws helped the Jews understand what cleanliness was, what holiness was, but that now in the new and eternal covenant, you're not bound to these uh, ritual food laws, ritual washing laws regarding cleanliness, okay? So, so the laws, Paul's going to explain this as time goes on, that they had a very special purpose of preparing the people of Israel for the new and eternal covenant so that they could understand what sin was. Because in order to understand sin, if you understand sin, then you can understand holiness. Then you can understand cleanliness. Then you can understand purity. So you can understand, you know, this offends God. I should not do this. So the laws, the laws were like a pedagogical teacher. Uh, among, the, uh, uh, among the ancients, there was, they, they had... Pedagog pedagogical teachers who kept their children from getting into too much trouble, okay? Uh, they kind of were just like, you know, guides who kept them from getting into too much trouble. And so Paul's going to explain in the future, he's going to say that, look, the Gentiles, they were just unframed. They just followed all their desires. But we had, we had the law, and God kept us from getting into trouble. Now, was the law good or bad? The law, was it good or bad? Good. Was it perfect or imperfect? It was perfect. You guys have forgotten. Psalm, Psalm 19. Psalm 19. You guys have already forgotten it. The heavens and earth, the heavens and earth declare the glory of God. All creation is pouring out praise. The heavens and earth declare the glory of God. All creation is pouring out praise day by day, pouring out his word. Look at how beautiful creation is. And then suddenly the psalm goes, stop everything. The law of God is perfect. It's like saying, natural revelation, all of creation, it's beautiful. You can know things about God, but hold on a second. Divine revelation is absolutely superior. God's revelation is perfect. Are you perfect? No. no. Okay, now you got the answer. <laughs>
<laughs> so now you can understand this, okay? So you get the idea. The law is God's perfect revelation, but we're not. And so, so in the new and eternal covenant, Paul's going to explain God gave this law, which is perfect. Every one of those laws is important. Every one of them is deeply uh, um, profound. Uh, it, but it's all preparing us for the new and eternal covenant in Christ. And so, so, so in this sense, you can, you can really understand what's going on here with the law. Uh, and we're going to get into the question about the law, the Torah, the, Pente the Pentateuch. We'll get into those questions as we, we go on. But Peter has this vision. He sees this sheet coming down from heaven. And then, then, he's go then a person's going to be sent to Peter when he's in Joppa. He's in Joppa. Why is it Joppa? You know where Joppa is? Any of you guys know where Joppa is? It's a harbor. It's a harbor on the water. And, and who went to Joppa and tried to get away from God? Jonah. Jonah. God, said, God said, go to the Gentiles. Go to your enemies. Go to the Gentiles. And what did Jonah do? He went the opposite direction. He went to Tarshish, which is probably where the Straits of Gibraltar are. He went the opposite direction, okay? I, I hope everybody showed up for the, the class today. Nobody went to St. John Neumann today, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that when I was driving over here. So Jonah, huh? I did. You, you, okay, very good. So you went the opposite direction this morning. So Jonah, <laughs> Jonah went the opposite direction. So, so what's amazing is Jonah went to Joppa, which is a harbor right on the side of Tel Aviv. Beaches of Tel Aviv. If you go there today, beautiful beaches of Tel Aviv on one side. Joppa's on the other side, right next to each other. And, you, and there's this old church in Joppa you can go to. And from that place, he wanted to flee from God. He wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord, from the face of the Lord. And so he flees from doing God's will, which is to go to the Gentiles and preach repentance. And so... Where does Peter have the vision that the Gentiles will be co-heirs? In Joppa. As they say, location, 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 right? So it's in Joppa that he has the vision. That's amazing if you think about it. The very place where Jonah said, I don't want to go to the Gentiles. I don't want to go to my enemies. And so Peter has the vision, and then God sends a Gentile to Peter. Who does he send to go to Peter? Who does he send to him? What's the guy's name? Cornelius, right. He sends a, a, a guy named Cornelius. Who was Cornelius? What was he? A centurion. That means he's a commander of how many people? A hundred. How many centurions do you have in a legion? Sixty. Well, normally speaking, the legion was 6,000, so you had, you had 60, 60 centurions with 100. So I just wanted to see if you guys knew that, but, you know. But so he sent Cornelius, a centurion, with his soldiers. They come to Peter, and then it, he, he talks to Peter about, about this vision that he had and how he'd been sent by God to meet Peter. And then what's the sign to Peter that the Gentiles can really become part of the new and eternal covenant. What's the major sign? What, is, what happens? They receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? They, 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 he sees that, wow, God's Spirit can actually work in these, these dirty, ugly, terrible Gentiles. That's amazing, you know? And so he, so he sees them receive the Holy Spirit. He understands they, they can become part of the people of the new and eternal covenant. And so why is God doing all this with Peter? That's the question I ask you. Why, this is, why do you think he's working with Peter on this question? Uh, Father, didn't Peter feel like that he was Jewish first, then Christian? Well, well... Right, so, so if, when, you, when you get to Galatians, we're going to see Peter had his own struggles about this. Like he's, Peter, it, Peter, was working pro, Peter and James were working primarily with Jews. Paul primarily with Gentiles. And so at one moment, Peter kind of just like separated himself. Like he, like he, he kind of like made this like little separation from the Gentiles, you know. Just, and, and Paul is saying, no, 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 Peter, you're, you're, you're misunderstanding the very covenant that we have here. Um, that's in Galatians, okay? Uh, but that, this hap that happens, we'll talk about that when we get to that in Galatians. 
But right here in Acts, you see, why is, Paul, why is God working through Peter? This is all in preparation for what? For Acts chapter 15. The council. The council. It's, it's like all these things. If you look at the Acts of the Apostles, so right after Paul's conversion, Paul's conversion is in Acts chapter 9. So then when you go to Acts chapter 10 through 14, you see the Lord in a special way. He's working through, through Peter, and he's also working through Paul, but in a special way, he's working through Peter. He's trying to say, Peter, look, this, this is what God's will is. This is what my will is, that the Gentiles can be co-heirs. Co-heirs. Why co-heirs? Equal in every way. Not second-class citizens, but equal in every way. And, that, and it's very important to, to understand that. And so that's Acts chapters 10 through 14. And then you have the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. That's, that's the first council, a local council in Jerusalem. But one of the most difficult issues to settle, you know, are, do we make Gentiles get circumcised? Do we make them follow all the you know, ritual diets in regards to food? Do we make them follow all the rules according to cleanliness? Okay, uh, and, and If you're a leopard or if you have a flow of blood and so forth. And so all that's settled in Acts chapter 15. And so when, when you get to Acts chapter 15, you can, you can see how this is settled. And if you go to, let's go to Acts chapter 15. How much time do we have? What time is it? Okay, perfect. Now, so let's go to Acts chapter 15, and, and let's see how this is settled right here. And if you go to Acts chapters, chapter 15, and if you go to verse 6, it says, the, 15, 6, it says, The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter arose and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, wow, that's an important verse right there because it helps us to remember Matthew chapter 16. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them what? The Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he makes no what? Distinction between them and and us. Very important word because in the book of Deuteronomy, God would always tell his people, show no partiality. Show no favoritism. So here's Peter using similar language. He makes, he made no distinction between us and them, but cleanse their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you make trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been, been able to? Do you see what Peter's saying? He's saying the law is perfect, but guess what? We're not. We're not. Why are you going to put that yoke on them? We couldn't even follow the law. We messed it up over and over again. And so do you see what he's, what he's kind of getting at here? Verse 11, but we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. What a beautiful line. We are saved by grace. It's a com completely a gift. Paul will explain this over and over again in his letters. Verse 12, and all the assembly did what after Peter spoke? Now, a lot of people say this is an amazing verse because usually, like, when the Pope speaks and says, you know, abortion, contraception, marriage only between a man and woman, instead of being silent, what do people do? They start murmuring, arguing, debating, you know, yeah. And so this is really amazing. All the people kept silent. So sometimes some modern readers find a little irony with this verse here. Um, but all the assembly kept silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take, to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. And it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up that the rest of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who has made these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should, should write to them to abstain from four things. What are the four things? Pollution of idols, 
from unchastity, from what is strangled, and from blood. Okay, and from from er, from early generations, Moses had in every city those who who preach him, for he treated every Sabbath, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so he goes on and it talks about how the council, if you go all the way to 16, chapter 16, it set out decrees. And so Timothy would accompany Paul and Silas, chapter 16. And if you go to verse 4, it says, As they went out on their way through the cities, they delivered to, the, to them for observation the decisions which had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were at Jerusalem. That's interesting. So I just want to look at that one verse here decisions because it's kind of an interesting verse okay all right so let's just go ahead here we go you can look at you can look at my notes on the council later so when you get to acts chapter 16 if you see it right here it's acts chapter 16 it says the greek word dogmata indicates the decrees or decrees commands or ordinances so the decisions is the word is dogmata have you ever heard that word before dogmata does that sound familiar dogmata does that what does that sound like dogma you guys wonder where we get all this stuff from right it's like i tell you you can find if you look you'll find it okay so page 68 but i thought that's that i thought that that is kind of an interesting thing like the word they're going out and they're bringing the dogmata to the rest of the church okay so that they will understand the the, the dogmata of the first council okay so so this is kind of a, a beautiful uh image of of paul and timothy and silas going out there continue to preach but they're also bringing the decision of the first council and out and sharing it with the rest of the church um, and so now in this next part of acts of the apostles i told you that in the first part there's a lot of focus on peter peter's preaching I'm sorry, yeah so 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 a lot of scholars will say that you know the the council in acts it's 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 a local church council yeah so it's so technically speaking it's not an, a, an ecumenical council one of the seven great ecumenical councils it's a local council so yeah so there so there are some things that paul does in acts the apostles uh, where he even has, you know, a Gentile circumcised because he's trying to to find a way to be able to be around Jews, re relate to Jews, reach Jews. Okay, so yeah. So, um, so in the very first part of Acts of the Apostles, we talked about how Peter had a major role. Okay, the preaching of Peter. You guys are noticing all that during this week. The preaching of Peter. Then a little bit later on, we're gonna get we're gonna get the. Um, the way that the Lord helps Peter understand that G the Gentiles are co-heirs, the Peter's words at the Council of Jerusalem, and then right after the council, now the focus is going to shift to who? Who's the focus? Paul. So we're going to see Paul, especially Paul, Timothy, and Silas going out on missionary journeys and preaching. And so what's beautiful is, is uh, we're not going to have time to go through it, but look at how... Whenever you're reading any of the books that, that are letters that Paul is writing, look and find out, you know, in the introduction, where does Paul talk, where does Paul meet this community first? You have to go back to Acts of the Apostles. And, and when you go back to the Acts of the Apostles, you can kind of see, ah, here's what first happened when Paul was there uh, or around that area. So look closely at the preaching of Paul. You'll have to study that on, on your own. Uh, but what I want to get at is, with his preaching, that he goes, he has certain trials, okay, uh, and and so in chapter in chapter uh, right after the council, he goes on a second missionary journey, and then a little bit later in chapter eighteen, he goes on his third missionary journey. I don't have it right here. I guess not. But he goes on his third missionary journey, um, which is his longest missionary journey. This is from chapter 18 all the way to chapter 21. Uh, and then finally, finally, when you, when you get to right around chapter 22, Paul is on trial. And that's kind of a, a section of Acts of the Apostles that, you know, we probably don't read as well. We love, 
We love his missionary journeys. We love when he's out there preaching and doing all this great stuff. But then when he's on trial, we kind of just maybe forget about that. But what's the final decision when he's on trial? Paul says, guess what, guys? Oh, before you cut my head, my head off or to stone me to death, hold on one second. I'm a what? I'm a what? I'm a Roman citizen. You know, I, I went on a... Um, uh, I, I, this year is our 20th anniversary for the class that I was ordained with. And so I went on a, every five years we go take a four day vacation. So I just came back with my class from vacation. And when I went through LAX, you know, it's amazing. Like you don't even have to show them their, your passport. It's kind of scary that you stick your face in front of this little thing. They, 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 and they say, hello, Timothy, have a nice day. And they, they, they it literally, have you, any of you guys done that? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Right. It's scary. But you know, you stick your face in front of the thing and they know who you are right away. But maybe it's because they already know who the people are on the plane. But what does Paul do? He appeals to the fact that he's a Roman citizen. And this, this becomes a major issue in his trial. Why? Because the Jews can't put him to death. They have to send him to Rome. And so eventually his fourth journey is going to be Paul is being sent to Rome. And he's going to be put on trial in Rome. He'll be a prisoner there, and he'll be put on trial in Rome. Uh, and so uh, the book ends with Paul in prison. And it's, it's really kind of ironic. Wow, Acts ends with Paul in prison. And I'll, I'll tell you, there's something providential about that. Because the church will always be persecuted until Christ comes again. And, and so it's, there's something to really consider there. Like if you just think of like Paul, he's in prison. Uh, he's on trial. And this is kind of saying something about the church. The church is going to be persecuted. It's going to be on trial by the world, not by the world. And it's going to be unjust until Christ comes again. You're going to say something, Israel? Oh, okay. Question. How many of the letters were written that in prison? Mm, yeah. So, so, we, so I have over at, the begin, at our introduction here, I might have, I might bring that up. I bring it up. I, I, um, I bring it up. It's... It is a little bit debated. It is a little bit debated, uh, but we'll get into we'll get into that question. And I can't. I don't have the exact uh, answer for you here. But that's a great question. We will talk about that. Um, any other thoughts or questions before we finish Acts of the Apostles? Yes. I, I'm still having trouble with the idea that, that uh, God's law is perfect, but yet some of the ritual laws were abandoned. Right. Right. It, yeah, it's very simple. Okay, so, so the question is, how do you explain that God's law is perfect, but now we don't have to follow ritual laws? It, well, you know, the, yeah, but does, yeah, the God himself changes the law. So the letter to the Hebrews explains that we're, in, we're under a new covenant. And so Peter basically says the same thing. If you look at what he's saying closely, he's saying, look, guys, we could never follow this law. We always broke it. You know, in, in the, the simplest explanation, I think, is God's law is perfect, God is perfect, but we're not perfect. And so in the new and eternal covenant, Jesus is not giving us an excuse for sin, but what he is doing is he's not imposing a burden upon us that we cannot carry. So if, if we were bound to the law, and, and if we were bound to follow the law perfectly, it would be a burden that no person could carry. And, and it seems like there's also, because in some cases, Jesus increased the difficulty. Uh, you know, so he's, right. He's less important. Right. Exactly. Exactly. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he, in, he raises the bar. Uh, if you look at the Old Testament and the New, when it comes to especially the issue of mercy, loving God, being a disciple, he raises the bar, exactly. And the re and, but he raises it, but he does it in a way that fulfills what the Old Testament always wanted. So in the Old Testament, Moses said, circumcise your heart. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, with all, with all who you, you know, you're being. And so it's not like he's giving us something new, but he's, he's raising the bar to help us to fill, fill what God was asking for right from the beginning. Yes. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let us take a break. Yes. I was reading this. I thought, I thought that means this change is hard. And then you realize that, but you just said, it's not really change. It's just changing our perception of what it was. So. 
Yeah, the concept. Jesus. The, the Jews yeah. Right, right, right. And, and, like, me, and likewise, you know, with the council, like, what do you mean they don't have to follow the law? So they're not, as you said, they're not really changing. So they really listen to what was said. It's a fulfillment. It's a fulfillment. Yeah, and and there is and that, that is a very important point. Like, the difference between a substantial change and a fulfillment. But let's take a break right now, okay? So we'll start with Romans right after this. You guys haven't signed in. Sign in here, please.